Hey, listeners, it's Dan here. I want to tell you about a company that I'm really excited about. It's called Current. It's a fintech company that's completely disrupting traditional banking. I'm a new Current customer. It's already helping me and my entire family manage our finances, all from one easy-to-use app. So try Current for yourself and get the app by going to current.com slash OK. That's current.com slash OK. Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA, Inc., and can be used everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. Welcome back to OK Computer. I'm Dan Nathan. I am joined by Packy McCormick of Not Boring. In just a little bit, we're going to be joined by Beltum Demirs from CoinShares. I think she's at a pool party or something down at Bitcoin Week in Miami. Packy, why are you not at Bitcoin Week in Miami? There's so many conferences. I've just kind of given up. Back in investment banking, you had to just give up on having a social life. I feel like being a parent who also writes, I just have given up on conferences and the FOMO is a lot less if I blanket give up on them. All right. Well, fair enough. You were writing yesterday. I had a great conversation with Scott Lynn, CEO, founder of Masterworks. They sell fractionalized fine art. You and I had a conversation with Scott back in the fall, and I think they are a sponsor of Not Boring. And I believe that you are also a Masterworks customer. So we're going to get in it with Scott. Lots going on when you think about just inflation and the risk assets that are working in this sort of environment. So Scott gives us the 411 on the fine art market and some of the other ancillary markets and how their platform is really I guess you call it democratizing fine art for the people. So that's a pretty interesting one. But you and I, we got a lot to talk about. Melton's going to join us in a little bit. But right now, we got to hit this Elon Musk story. Monday morning, the market is all a Twitter because there's a headline. You see what I did there? That Elon Musk took a 9.2% passive stake in Twitter, said he's going to make some significant improvements. He didn't have a whole heck of a lot to say other than that on Twitter. But today, Tuesday, as we're recording this, this morning we wake up and he is joining the board of Twitter. Now, I found this whole story fascinating. The stock was up 30% at one point. You can do the math. End of the day, I think at a $30 billion market cap, this thing had basically been in the dumps. It was down more than 50% from its all-time highs made last year. Talk to me, man. What were some of your first impressions? You were active on Twitter. You kind of mess around with it a little bit. You use it to dispense some of your content, engage with people. You don't seem to be a power user where it's like necessary to your business. Ooh, I think it's necessary to the business. It's probably the platform that if someone threatened to take it away, I would pay the most money to stay on. Even Substack, which I use to write the newsletter, I can move my newsletter over. I own the mailing list. I mean, I guess this is the web two, web three thing or the fact that I don't control my social graph on Twitter, but there's nowhere else that I have the conversation that I have on Twitter, the ability to get the things that I write and record out to a bunch of people. I intentionally don't host a closed, not boring community because I feel like so much of that takes place already on Twitter. It's been fun watching Elon over the past few days because I think one of the most fun things about being alive in 2022 is that the richest man in the world spends half his time like the rest of us do shit posting on Twitter. But seeing it over the past week or so leading up to this, when he asked people if he thought that Twitter was overly controlling on speech and did a good enough job controlling speech, if, if he should launch a competitor, obviously people saying that he should buy the platform. I actually think him buying a non-controlling interest, a 9.2% passive stake, and then taking a board seat is actually a really good outcome. People have made the joke over and over and over again. This is the first time that a Twitter user has actually joined the board. But I think there's something really valuable of someone who has built an even bigger microphone on the platform getting involved. Well, that's really funny. I know a lot of ex-Twitter people, and not many of them are particularly good at Twitter. Many of them don't even tweet. They've had people join their board who don't even tweet or have never tweeted. Our friend Katie Stanton of Moxie Ventures, who is a co-host of OK Computer, had a funny tweet. She's good at Twitter. She said that was a really expensive way to try to get an edit button. And I thought that was funny, but you talked about this Web 2, Web 3 thing. I'm not sure an edit button fixes this. Let's be really frank. They have 330 million monthly active users. They monetize at a dramatically lower rate than Facebook that has nearly 3 billion monthly active users. The platform's not growing. Their monetization doesn't really get that much better. Customers don't really enjoy it much. You say it's important. 
important to your business because you don't have to run a Discord. You don't have to run all these other closed group chats because it's all there. But that being said, how much do you actually really engage with the people? It is a bull horn for all intents and purposes. You push it out. And I just tell you this, the longer that I'm on it and the more consistent content that you push out, I push out a lot of video or audio, the less engaged it gets. The algos know it. They want people communicating with each other. And so to me, I actually don't think it goes anywhere. And I'll tell you this, man, if I was not on CNBC and I was not doing the sort of content I'm doing, there's no fucking way I'd be on Twitter because it really just doesn't bring me any joy other than being a really great RSS feed for news. But that means you'd have to unfollow all of the individuals other than journalists, if you will. I think probably the right answer is to take more Twitter diets. It is addicting. I spend too much time on Twitter. I check it pretty early in the morning. I don't, to your point, care really when I click into the notifications, what I've been notified on. Like I kind of just scroll through a bunch of it, but I do care that the notifications are there and I'm trained to click it. That said, when it's good, it's really good. Like the fact that something happens and the whole world is in one place having a conversation is amazing. The fact that you can talk to the richest person in the world on that platform is a really cool thing. Yeah, but you're not talking. No one's engaging with Elon Musk. Once a month, he'll drop this little tweet back to somebody. He just gave somebody a Tesla, right? Who engaged with him on Twitter the other day. And you're all like geeked up about it. It did its job. There's like a million packies out there really excited about it. I'm just kidding. I don't mean to be kind of sending about it. My point is, again, this planet has nearly 8 billion people and Facebook has a third of them on their platform in one way, shape or form. And these guys have 330 million. It really is an echo chamber. Let's just get down to this in a way. Why does he give a shit? I said this on Fast Money yesterday. He's kind of like Roy Hobbs, right? He can do whatever he wants. Anything he wants to do, he just does. It defies gravity. And I'm not even talking about making the rockets and relanding them or changing the electric grid or all this sort of stuff that he's just defied a lot of logic and his ability to do this. I'm talking about what does he give a shit about Twitter? He's not censored when you think about it. And I just don't understand. Does this go back to that whole who owns Web3 thing? Because you remember Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, got this spat in December, you and I talked about it a lot on OK Computer, where once Jack left the CEO and left the board, he basically was calling out guys like Mark Andreessen saying, you know who owns Web3? The VCs own Web3. And it was kind of interesting to watch. Elon has actually interacted a lot with Mark Andreessen on this. And Mark Andreessen recently came back to the platform He's got the current thing and making fun of everybody. And I don't find it particularly interesting one way or another or entertaining. I guess my point is, what is this about? Is it just trolling Jack Dorsey? Is that why he took a two and a half billion dollar stake? And listen, this is a guy who was also tweeting memes. The new CEO that took over for Jack Parag Agarwal, he tweeted him as Stalin back in December shortly after it. So I just don't really get what's going on. I don't find it particularly interesting. I know we're talking about it right now because it basically has moved the stock in a massive way. And I don't know, something feels like it's going to happen. I suspect it ends up being like his little dalliance with Dogecoin. He gets bored and he moves on and he basically takes a billion dollar gain. And he's like, F you, Jack. There's a couple of ways to look at it. One is, and this is the Matt Levine thesis on this, is that he knows at this point that things increase in value with proximity to Elon. And so he knows that he can make some money. The money is completely meaningless, but maybe it's like a fun little thing to prove that you can do. The most, me being an optimist and giving people the benefit of the doubt, interpretation of this is, I think the free speech piece is a sideshow. There were so many people who, when he started tweeting that and saying he should start his own platform and all of that, said, look, I've actually built products. Where do you draw the line between banning hate speech and doing X, Y, or Z thing or taking down child pornography and doing X, Y? So it is really tough to figure out what the lines are. And I don't think that he has any special ability to do that. The optimistic case here or the me just being a total gullible idiot on it case is he's the closest thing that the world has to this hypothetical benevolent dictator who is a philosopher king and is doing all of this stuff for the good of humanity. He is making the human race multi-planetary. He has made environmentalism cool and potentially profitable. He does the boring thing. He did solar. And what is the point of going to the stars and of keeping the planet going for all the time if everybody's just in this cesspool yelling at each other? And so maybe he thinks, look, I can come and make this place more fun or help on the bot problem. It just feels like one of those meta problems that even if humans can live forever, If you can't figure out the discourse and you can't figure out a way for people to talk to each other in this new world, what's the point? So that's the best case. Let me just tell you this. 
Packy, I'm a bit older than you and you grew up on all these platforms. I've figured them out and I know how to use them. There are very few Americans who actually really give a shit about this story. Our listeners care about it and we're the ones talking about it and tweeting about it and podcasting about it or whatever. Most people just don't give a shit at the end of the day. The other thing that's really interesting is, is we're supposedly coming out of this pandemic after more than two years now and you think of all the loss of life and hardship and all that sort of stuff and you look at a guy like Elon and you call him a benevolent dictator and all this stuff that he's been able to do and at the end of the day and very sadly and I'm not wishing anything on him if he didn't exist tomorrow it'd be like that scene in Jerry Maguire where Jerry leaves the office after getting canned and everything just goes back to its daily life if that is true with Elon what is the fucking point if Elon goes away and everything goes back to the way that it was. At some point, you can kind of reduct the out of certain anything. No, it goes back to rockets going to outer space and coming back and landing. There's other organizations. There's other people can do it. There's other people who can make EVs. Other people didn't start doing it before Elon started doing it, at least moving that way. EVs were Toyota Priuses. Maybe you get there, but maybe it's five years later when you have 30 years to reverse this thing. Five years really matters. And I do think that he's had a real meaningful impact. And I think that some of the things that he does are totally fucking stupid. Like I think a lot of the stances that he took in the beginning of COVID were kind of dumb. There have been many, many times when he looks like this gesture and his SNL appearance was a little bit sad. I'm not purely defending Elon, but I think on those couple of cases to say, look, let's go do some really, really hard things that feels like humans haven't been doing for a while. I think that that is an immeasurable contribution to humanity. Yeah, well, I'll tell you one thing who should be watching his ass right now is Parag Agarwal. If Twitter has all these problems, they're primarily technical. They're things that Facebook have figured out from a technical standpoint, and they have not been able to figure it out and then scale them in a way. So the idea of replacing the founder with the CTO who had been there for a very long time doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense with me. I'm sure Elon looks at him and thinks that he's basically, he couldn't hold his jock. So good luck with that one. They're going back and forth on Twitter last night before they announced the board thing this morning where Elon did a poll on whether or not there should be an edit button and Parag retweeted it and said the impact of this will be important, alluding to the fact that the poll would lead to an edit button or not an edit button. So he's having fun with it now. I don't know if it matters. It's funny though, an open API fixes that, an edit button fixes that. I just don't get it. I mean, the problem is, is that if you haven't used Twitter already and you have a smartphone in your hand and you have a brain in your head, then you're not likely to use it anytime soon unless there's a whole new suite of offerings or a whole new user experience. So to me, good luck with that. I do think on one of those technical issues, and I can't remember what it was when Elon was going back and forth with Prag, you know, that dude Boz over there at Facebook, he weighed in and he was like, no, that's not a big technical issue. We fixed that years ago. And then Elon just responds to him. Facebook gives me the willies, which I freaking love. That's like amazing. <laughs> Again, I think when we're talking about it in our little bubble, in our echo chamber, it's kind of fun to talk about it in Fast Money. We're leading with it two nights in a row. We can't quit Elon. At the end of the day, it's not too different than, I guess, the whole Trump fascination by the media. They know it works. They know it's engaged. They know it's one of those things where people are going to take different sides. They get hot on it. So a Twitter bull case that would have accounted for this ahead of time would be something along the lines of a disagreement with, I think, your fundamental point here that Twitter is not important. It has 330 million users. I think they've done an okay job of not counting trolly users. People are super, super, super engaged. I can't remember the last time I used Facebook. I rarely use Instagram. I think the way they're monetizing it is wacky. Their ad product has never worked. I think they could sell a high-end subscription product. I think there's a bunch of stuff that they could do to turn the business around. But the thesis would be that I think it's really hard for this group of, call it a quarter of those 330 million users I think among that group, it's the stickiest product there is. And so it has a lot of time to figure out some way of turning the business into a good business. I think more than a lot of other businesses. It didn't have a lot of time because the stock literally two weeks ago was trading like 15% above its IPO price from 19 years ago. I saw Ed Siegel, the CFO of the company, a couple months ago, was right after they had a very disappointing earnings report and they announced some huge buyback. And I said to him, I was a couple drinks in at this point, I was like, watch out, activists are coming. They do not want to see your broken product, the company using one of their most important resources right now, which is their cash, to be buying back their stock. It sends the wrong signal. So to me, 
me, I'll be very frank, and I've said it probably on OK Computer, I've said it on Fast Money, what actually needs to happen is Snap needs to merge with Twitter, and Evan Spiegel needs to take over the company, and they need to advance the product the way that he's been successfully able to push his thing along. That, to me, seems like a layup, or it needs to be a feature on a much larger platform like Google, where Google has six or seven products that have over a billion users. I know you say that, but one of the things that you use every day for no good reason is Google. The other argument, and I'm not even this pro Twitter. I love the product, whatever, but I do think Google is degrading. The results are getting worse and worse. At least Twitter's core product, both a blessing and a curse that it's evolved very, very little. Do you think YouTube is getting worse and worse? YouTube is good. Twitter has one killer app and it's real-time search. And that is that whole RSS news aspect that we're talking about. Listen, you and I could go on and on. We have Meltem Demir. She's coming in. We're going to talk about a couple Starks. It's not Game of Thrones, but we're going to talk about this guy, John Reed Stark, in a Twitter thread the other day that Meltem texted to me and said was clownish. We're going to talk about Elizabeth Stark in the Lightning Network. That will be interesting. We're going to go back to Fred Wilson because Fred is a prolific blogger. He doesn't do podcasts, I here, but he had a really interesting post the other day on scaling the Ethereum ecosystem. Love to get your take on all of that. So stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, Dan. What up, guy? You're into this fintech. What's all this I'm hearing about Current? You're going to like this guy. Current is a fintech company that's completely disrupting traditional banking. Wait a second. Does that mean I don't have to drive to the bank anymore? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I'm a new Current customer, and I manage all of my finances from one easy-to-use app. Well, I got to get this app, but where can I learn more? It's super easy. Just go to Current.com slash OK, O-K-A-Y, and download the app. That's Current.com slash OK. Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA Inc. and can be used everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. All right, we're back. We have Meltem. Meltem was a little late. She didn't meet her call time, as we call it in the biz. But Meltem, Packy and I just had a fun back and forth on all this Elon stuff with Twitter. But here was a Twitter thread that I thought was really interesting by a guy named John Reed Stark. And Michael Burry, the Michael Burry from the Big Short tweeted this out. You know, the guy who Christian Bale played in the movie. And I thought this was really interesting because this guy Stark, the first part of his thread, I worked at the SEC for 18 plus years, the last 11 as a chief for the SEC Office of Internet Enforcement. I've taught cyber law at Georgetown and Duke Law for 20 years. I spent five years at Stroch Friedberg fighting cyber crime. Why I believe the bulk of Web3 is both scourge and scam. And we could go on and on. We'll put the tweet thread in show notes. But Melton, you had one response to me over text. Clownish. Talk to me, sister. I think what I said originally was cope. First of all, if you read the first tweet, he posted it on April 1st. I thought it was a joke and I had to read it several times to realize it wasn't a joke. So let's start by the first tweet in this thread. The first tweet, this gentleman does something that using Cialdini's principles of persuasion appealed to authority. He literally made a slide which belongs in slide hell. It's so bad. I didn't figure out what it was until I started actually reading what's on the slide. It's the logos of the different agencies and law firms where he worked. It's wild. And he does this thing where he appeals to authority and he's like, hey, I worked these institutions. I went to these prestigious universities. Therefore, you should trust me. If you know anything about crypto, you know that crypto doesn't care about who you are, where you went to school, number one. Number two, who would brag about being in enforcement at the SEC when you oversaw two decades of financial grift that resulted in not a single conviction or a single perpetrator of two of the largest financial crises in American history without a single person going to jail? That is your opening tweet. I think is media disqualifier. Then what's so crazy about the whole thread is literally what he goes through to talk about is a direct contradiction because everything he claims DeFi is, is actually direct rebuttal against the traditional financial system. I don't really understand if you're talking about banking in the sector you work in, or if you're talking about crypto. And at the end of it, if you manage to make it all the way to the end, he ends the tweet thread with a shill for his personal blog and his consulting services, which I'm just like, read the room. 
The problem is like me, I'm just a normie. I'm the guy with a mic and I'm talking to really smart people here and I'm trying to bring up kind of issues. But Dan, you're not a normie. You own a crypto dick butt. Yeah, I do. You know what's funny? I followed you into the dick butts and then I followed Packy into the chain runners there. And I'm just a follower. This guy's trying to protect me because I'm the one going deep in some of the weirdo stuff in NFT land. What was your take on this, Packy? Because listen, when you read something like this, there's stuff in there that you can say, okay, that makes sense. And there's a lot of people that should be reading this stuff because they probably need to think twice before buying a crypto dick butt. Not investment advice, but maybe crypto dick butt's not the best example to pick on. I think that's a pretty sound investment. My meta point on all of this is that everybody's fucking shilling something and that the bears and the skeptics get away with it and seem smarter and more responsible when the long arc of history is that if you listen to them and you don't participate in any way because they scare you away, you've lost more than you would have lost had you gotten involved and just tried to learn a little bit and done it responsibly. The rest of it, some stuff are fine points. None of it's new. He, to Meltem's point, appealed to authority and so packaged it up in a way that was, look, look, look. All the stuff that everybody else has said, also somebody from the SEC and Duke Law and Georgetown Law is saying the same exact thing. There are 100% holes. I feel like we're kind of in this trough of disillusionment period right now. Yes, of course, NFTs are not going to save the world. All the things that the biggest bulls and cheerleaders and even shillers have said, maybe all of that doesn't come true, but that doesn't mean you throw everything out. I think there's a ton of great stuff happening and that will continue to happen. And I think the next you know, few years are going to be spectacular, hopefully, for the things being built in the space that will answer some of this. But it feels like a lot more of the same, but with someone who looks particularly serious in his picture and his credentials. Yeah. And then, so Melton, I'd say this, I wonder, do you know Elizabeth Stark from the Lightning Network? Because here's a woman that I think like you has been very earnest in figuring out how to build things, how to make it better. You guys have a certain set of beliefs and you're going forward with it. And it doesn't matter if there's a crypto winter or this and that, whatever. And the news this week was that Lightning Labs raised $70 million to Bitcoinize the US dollar. And I thought this was an interesting headline. And I'm just curious, what does that mean to you in a way? One of the criticisms about Bitcoin was that as a means of transaction, as a currency, that it's slow. She's creating this lightning network that is this layer two to speed up the transactions, make them cheaper. Is this something that is finally happening on the Bitcoin protocol, I guess, if you will? And I'm just curious to give us some thoughts about how this might really impact Bitcoin's usage as a currency. On Lightning. So Elizabeth's been a friend of mine for a long time. I was one of the first investors in Lightning back in the day when people first started talking about sort of Bitcoin Layer 2. And now we have multiple approaches to Bitcoin Layer 2. We have Lightning, just focusing on transactions. There's now actually Bitcoin Layer 3, which is being announced this week in Miami, focused on communication. There's stacks, they're just smart contracts layer on top of Bitcoin. And this is interesting because there was a recent post about Ethereum development. Ethereum stood at crossroads. Historically, one of the things that was always really different between Bitcoin and Ethereum is Bitcoin in its early days, super experimental, super flexible. And then over time, as the Bitcoin protocol created more value, the importance of keeping the core code base for Bitcoin more tightly controlled, not changing things while in flight with billions of dollars of value on the network became one of the core tenants. And Bitcoin has stayed fairly simple and fairly non-complex. And that's been, I think, a key strength of Bitcoin. Now, Ethereum has taken the other approach where Ethereum is really complex and its surface area and complexity has grown quite a bit. But Ethereum, now that it's a half a trillion dollar protocol, is sort of at a similar crossroads where the question is, do we embed more complexity in sort of Ethereum layer one or do we push a lot of that complexity to layer twos through bridges and layer twos built on top of Ethereum? I think eventually every protocol goes through this turning point. And we've seen this anytime you have a lot of complexity at the base layer, subsequent changes are infinitely more complex to implement. And there's a ton more surface area for risk. So I think what's been interesting, two fundamentally different design philosophies faster and more experimental isn't always better. Altus and Bridges, very new technology in the last three months alone, over a billion dollars of hacks on different bridges and L2s. And that, again, is not a criticism. It's just any time you're moving really quickly, trying new things that have a lot of complexity, a lot of moving parts, you're creating a lot of surface area for vulnerability and attack. So I just think it's two different philosophies. I do think this year is going to be a banner year for Bitcoin. I'm really excited to see more products, more services being built on top of Lightning, on top of Stacks. And the trend I'm really excited about, I'm coining it right here. It's BitFi, it's Bitcoin DeFi. So instead of bridging our Bitcoin over to Ethereum via highly custodial bridge, which is the process of wrapping and creating wrapped Bitcoin, what if we use 
Bitcoin in DeFi on Bitcoin layer twos without requiring so many intermediaries and custodians to wrap that Bitcoin. So BitFi, it's going to be a huge trend. Lightning's leading the way. I think we'll also see stable coins on top of Bitcoin, which I think will be a huge unlock because it allows Bitcoin compatible DeFi to happen on top of Bitcoin. And what people forget, Tether originally was built on top of the Bitcoin layer two. It was built on top of the Omni relay protocol. Tether grew on top of Bitcoin, it made dollars compatible with Bitcoin in terms of trading and settlement. And so I think a similar thing is going to happen this year with just a broader range of DeFi applications. I'm a bull on any and all innovation in the space and stuff that enables more, which I think Lightning Network is certainly in that category. I want to click into BitFi a little bit. What are the types of things that you're seeing? Are things being built now? Do you think as layer three comes out or as lightning grows, more things will be built? What's the state of the building on top of Bitcoin ecosystem right now? So I think number one, again, native Bitcoin DeFi or BitFi, I think is a huge application. So being able to leverage your Bitcoin as collateral to take out a Bitcoin-based stablecoin loan and to utilize that in different parts of Bitcoin ecosystem, number one. Number two, I think secure private peer-to-peer -peer communication on top of Bitcoin is really compelling. What people always forget is blockchains are value transmission protocols, yes, but at its core, they're communication protocols. They're secure peer-to-peer -peer communication protocols. It's just the messages we relay are UTXOs or unsent transaction outputs. And so it's information about Bitcoin transactions, but it is at its core a messaging protocol, a communication protocol. And so I think there's a lot of really cool stuff happening right now around using Bitcoin as a peer-to-peer -peer transmission layer that includes new peer-to-peer -peer video applications and video messaging applications. We're seeing the implementation of the first peer-to-peer -peer file sharing applications that leverage both Bitcoin and IPFS on the back end, which for those who don't know, IPFS is a distributed file storage protocol. So instead of leveraging AWS and AWS data centers, you shard your data amongst multiple nodes and it's stored in this distributed network. Really cool fact, IPFS today has one twelfth of the storage capacity of AWS. It's growing really quickly and it will very soon be one of the larger pieces of public cloud infrastructure that's fully decentralized. I wanted to hit Packy on this. Fred Wilson at USV on his AVC blog the other day, he had a post calling Scaling the Ethereum Ecosystem. He was just basically talking about how clogged and expensive it is right now. When we think about a lot of these other layer twos that have come out, uh, they're really trying to get at that expense and the speed and all that sort of stuff. So I'm just curious, Packy, with some of the stuff that you're seeing as far as in DeFi and NFTs, is this bubbling up as an issue right now? And is it something that, I guess, maybe is it barreling into this proof of work into proof of stake? And is that going to be one of the issues that helps alleviate some of this stuff? Or basically like Meltem's saying, does there need to be more development as it relates to Bitcoin, what you're seeing in BitFi to kind of alleviate this problem? Both. I think that there is a ton of money in the Bitcoin ecosystem that is unproductive right now. And so the more you can build on top of that, the better. And so I think that the BitFi thesis makes a ton of sense. At the same time, one of the things that I'm most excited for, I think, is this multi-chain world. I talked to Ryan Pellegrino at Layer Zero Labs last week, and they're building an easy way for you to say, swap something on Polygon with something on Ethereum, maybe bring Solana and Ethereum, so not even necessarily two EVM compatible chains. Do that all without having to take the 12 steps that you might have to take right now to swap across chains. The more that all of that stuff can disappear, I think the better the Web3 ecosystem is. I think crypto dick butts are just on Ethereum. So I don't know if you've had to have the pleasure of even trying to go over to Polygon, which I think is really great once you get over there. There is that panic when you're like, oh shit, I just moved a bunch of ETH over to this place and it's not showing up for a little while. So the more you can remove all of that stuff from the process, the better. That's what I think Fred's post was about and basically saying that the non-compatible with EVM, this is just the state of play right now, but hopefully this is the stuff that's being developed. All right, one last thing here, Melton, before you get back to it. There was a Wall Street Journal article talking about short sellers betting against Tether. How annoyed are you by this story? It keeps popping back up. But I'll tell you, traditional finance people who are somewhat skeptical of crypto in general, they can't leave this story alone. And this story was talking about how a few investment firms, including Firtree and Viceroy Research, have placed substantial bets in recent months that the price of Tether will fall. Short sellers are betting 
that the $82 billion portfolio that underpins Tether's value, now the size of a big money market fund, is at risk of losses and that the parent company has not disclosed. Now, we know that, remember last summer, when Coinbase, with their USDC, they made some disclosures about what was backing that. Why is it that this story persists? I think you have to go back to the financial crisis because when the money market broke the buck, that was really something that caused people to see something that they'd never seen before. And then really, it just kind of opened the floodgates for what happened over the next couple of years. So I'm curious, why does this story persist? And what do people like you who are in the know, what do you know that some of these funds betting against Tether don't? So Bitcoin FUD or Bitcoin fear, uncertainty and doubt has been around since I've been in the industry. So for the last eight years, there's three core pieces of FUD. Number one is Bitcoin mining is going to boil the oceans. And as we saw this week, right on cue, Chris Larson from Ripple is paying Greenpeace and a bunch of other NGOs to basically do smear campaign on Bitcoin, which is great. Good luck with that. We've tried this before, but let's do this again. Two is that Tether is going to blow up. That's been around forever. Hilarious. And also, by the way, there's also this crazy narrative that persists that somehow USDC is better than Tether. And it's like, they're backed by the same stuff. Where do you put $70 billion of cash? Guess what? There's not a whole lot of places you can shove $70 billion of cash. There's really limited number of places. And then the third piece of Bitcoin FUD is that whales control Bitcoin and the Gini coefficient of Bitcoin is terrible and therefore Bitcoin shouldn't exist. And that's a whole scene. So look, the Tether FUD's been around forever. Good luck to these firms. Look, the free marketing value of this, maybe it's worth it. I've seen this story a thousand times, a thousand different ways. And we just keep repeating it. I'm like, guys, it hasn't happened yet. The probability at this point of it happening is very low, but like go off with your bad selves. And we're talking about it. So we're maybe to blame because if you look in the Wall Street Journal article, at some point they're like, yeah, actually Genesis said that most of the shorts have covered their trades. So I don't even know what the point of the article was because the headline is firms shorting Tether. Hacky, the message is Bitcoin bad, crypto bad. Hold on, guys. Hold on. A lot of people took their shorts off before Enron class. I mean, come on. I'm not even saying that's like a good or a bad thing. I'm just saying that the story is about people putting these shorts on. And then halfway through the article, it was like, by the way, Genesis said that most of these shorts have come off in the past few months. There was no article is all I'm saying, but it does continue to generate buzz. All right, listen, I got my FUD. You guys got your bull case stories here, and I think it's all good. We got to push back a little bit on some of this stuff. Listen, I would appreciate Meltem taking some time out of a busy week down there in Miami and obviously Packy in between doing what you do on Not Boring. I'm sure there's a 14,000 word missive coming out any moment here. So we really appreciate it, guys. So when we come back, we have Scott Lynn, CEO and founder of Masterworks. Thanks. Hey, it's Dan here. I'm excited to tell you about a $1 billion app that's disrupting the way people like you and me invest. It's called Masterworks. They offer investors access to an estimated $1.7 trillion alternative asset that was once only accessible by the ultra wealthy. I'm talking about blue chip art. Blue chip art has seen price appreciation that's outpaced the S&P 500 by 164% from 1995 to 2021. And the Wall Street Journal recently called it among the hottest markets on earth. It's no wonder the ultra-rich like Jeff Bezos recently sold tons of Amazon stock and bought more art. And now you can too with the art investment app called Masterworks.io. Join over 300,000 members for free on Masterworks.io. Just go to Masterworks.art slash OKComputer, O-K-A-Y. That's Masterworks.art slash OKComputer. See important disclosures at Masterworks.io slash Disclaimer. Scott Lynn is the founder and CEO of Masterworks.io, a company that he founded in 2017 that lets investors buy and sell shares in multi-million dollar pieces of art. He's also been an active collector in contemporary art for more than 15 years. Before Masterworks, Scott founded Payability, a digital lending provider in 2014. Scott Lynn, welcome back to OK Computer. How are you, bud? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. It's certainly our pleasure here. All right, let's talk about Masterworks a little bit because we had you on back in September and we had a good old-fashioned debate with Packy McCormick. It really wasn't much of a debate because he's a huge Masterworks fan. I think he's a customer and he's invested in a bunch of paintings with Masterworks, but we were really trying to get to the bottom of this NFT craze. And it was a craze. This was early September and Visa had just bought, I think, a CryptoPunk and the apes were going crazy and it was just mania a little 
little bit. I think things have slowed down a little bit and interest has slowed down. I know that the floor values of some of the blue chip groups have increased, but you guys have also seen for a whole host of macro reasons that have nothing to do with all the Web3 stuff, increased interest. Your space in particular in the fine art space or traditional art as you might define it has actually also done really well. And a lot of that has to do with inflation expectations and maybe some volatility around traditional risk assets. But talk to us about your business. I think at the time, you guys have maybe just crossed 340,000 customers. What's going on with Masterworks? And we'll get to the art market in a second here. I think that number now is around 400,000. We continue to see huge demand from investors looking to diversify into this asset class. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. One, if you look at contemporary art specifically, it has outperformed the S&P for the past 25 years. It has negligible correlation. So it acts as a good diversifier. But as you mentioned, one of the new themes that we're hearing on lots of phone calls are concerns about inflation and how investors should think about their portfolio in the context of inflation. Should they be investing more in real assets? How does art perform during inflation? So we're hearing a lot about that. At the time, I think Fed Chair Powell was calling inflation expectations transitory or some of the readings that they were getting as transitory. He was tying it to some of the supply chain dislocations and the easy monetary policy all around the world as it related to the pandemic. And I think at the time, this was before Omicron, people really thought that we'd be coming out of that and maybe interest in some of these deemed inflation hedges might abate. But you guys are staffing up here. First of all, you had a nice feature in Barron's a few weeks ago, and there was a story that you just hired a gentleman who was the head of art services at Bank of America's private bank. So I think that's really interesting when people say fine art or traditional art is just a thing that you hang on the wall. You guys view it as an asset class. You built a business around it as an asset class, and you're rating some of the biggest banks in the world. Talk to us a little bit about that, because I also think I read that you guys are the largest art buyer in the world, expecting to maybe buy a billion dollars worth of art this year? We look at art, like most other investors, look at every other asset class. So when we think about building a framework for investors to understand performance, we have a research team that does index construction on the asset class. We look at historical appreciation rates. We look at volatility and return. We look at risk adjuster return or what people think of as sharp ratios for all the different artist markets. We view it as an asset class, just like anything else. And One of the things we found is that in in terms of people we hire, they tend to be these very specific types that have a strong interest in finance, as well as a strong interest in art. And that's the case of Evan, who joined us from Bank of America. So that's pretty typical of the team we're building out. Talk to me a little bit about that, because I know a lot of retail people, people who would never buy a piece of fine art that have accounts with Masterworks and they buy shares in a Banksy or something like that. And for them, they see it as diversification, but they also see it as something that is increasing their interest in something that maybe has nothing to do with finance in a way. So your ability to attach it to it is very interesting. But when you use terms like sharp ratio and you're hiring people like Evan, you're also speaking to an audience that is very very interested in return. Is that correct? So talk to us about how you barbell the business a little bit geared towards the high net worth individuals or also potentially institutions. That's right. I mean, when we're speaking to the art community, we're obviously talking about things like cultural significance and how we view different artist markets and different paintings that we're trying to get access to. But that's really a very different language than what we use with the investing community or our investors. And One of the things we know today is out of the 400,000 people who are on the platform, as you said, I mean, they're primarily interested in generating returns. I think some people may have an interest in the art market broadly, or they may like the idea of learning about a new asset class for the first time. But first and foremost, they're really, really concerned about returns. All right. So let's take a step back because what's really changed since you and I last talked about this on the pod, inflation, what were expectations that many thought were going to be transitory? Not only have they stuck, but a lot of people are expecting them to stick around. A lot of people, what I mean, Federal Reserve, Jamie Dimon is out this morning talking about it in his annual letter. The Fed is taking it very seriously to the point where they're raising interest rates aggressively. And I think most economists or strategists did not expect this, let's say six, nine months ago. And so it caused some volatility in the stock market. And when we talk about holding periods that you guys have, we're talking about, what, three to 10 years or so. And maybe you can give us a sense of the average holding period and then the sort of average return that you're kind of seeking. Because with inflation where it is, we're seeing a lot of volatility in traditional risk markets. And then with interest rates going higher,
higher, the cost of money has gone higher, and investment returns are being scaled back a little bit. Give us a sense of like how you're thinking about this, and were you guys expecting a higher inflationary period with higher rates? We're not macro people. We don't really make predictions around things like inflation. That being said, we have relationships with pretty much every major private bank. We provide a lot of the data on the art market for them to understand the asset class. So we have working relationships with most of them. And interestingly, I think private banks in today's world are divided with what their outlook on inflation is. With respect to art, we often get the question, how does art behave in an inflationary environment? And the truth is we don't exactly know. What we do know is that art prices have outperformed inflation as far back as our data goes, which is back to the 60s and 70s. So when you look at the 1970s in the U.S., which are inflationary times, we saw art prices really outperform inflation. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that art is a hedge against inflation. It just means that for all the periods that we looked at, it's really outperformed inflation. That's kind of the extent of our thinking on art with inflation. But I think Generally speaking and broadly speaking, you you can say that real assets are a hedge, I guess, quote unquote, during inflationary times. And that's what I was kind of getting at. I wouldn't expect you guys were seeing prints in the CPI, the consumer price index at 40-year highs, 8 9% or so. Maybe it tops out somewhere near 10%. And I think the data that you quoted here that you guys have on the art market is you're having average returns of up to 10% a year without a whole heck of a lot of volatility. And I think your point about real assets, I mean, that's kind of the playbook. When you think about what's going on with real estate all over the world, why there's interest in some of this digital stuff that exists in the NFT world, it's the sort of thing that supposedly is scarce. And I want to hit on that a little bit, because again, if you're the largest art buyer in the world right now, you have a good sense for supply and demand. Are you seeing new entrants to the market? Because this might maybe anecdotally give a sense for what sort of demand there is for hard assets. Are you seeing some new fine buyers that you're competing with a little bit? And is that only going to increase over time? New entrants for us are, are very different. Obviously, there's very direct competitors to Masterworks. Today, there's not really any. We're really operating in an environment where we, we have no competition. From an art market perspective, we always see major collectors entering and leaving the market at different times. Like Jeff Bezos right now is a huge buyer in the art market, and he's obviously sucking up a lot of supply. Supply and demand dynamics in the asset class are really interesting, and I talk about this a lot. I think a lot of people don't appreciate this very unique characteristic about the art market. So within the art market, you obviously have museums or institutions that own paintings for the purpose of public good. And many people aren't aware that there's this organization, I believe, called the AMA, which is an organization that all of these museums belong to. And there's ethical guidelines that effectively require museums to not sell paintings after they're donated to the museum. So you have this asset class that operates with this mousetrap, which effectively takes supply out of the market continuously, and those paintings remain indefinitely being held at museums. I think that's unlike any other asset class. Like most asset classes you think about, there's more supply every single day, right? There's more gold that's mined every day. There's more companies that are started. There's more buildings that are built. And in the art market, when these artists hit a certain level of cultural significance, you have this natural mousetrap that starts to take them out of private circulation and into museums. So I think that has an indirect impact on supporting prices and increasing prices over time. You just mentioned Bezos. Tesla founder Elon Musk just crossed him as the richest man in the world. And he just took this morning a 9% stake worth nearly $3 billion in Twitter. Now, you don't give a shit about that, but that guy renounced, he, I think he sold all his homes a couple years ago. He just lives on people's couches. He's the richest guy. You need to get that guy's ear and you got to get him to start buying some mansions again, because that way he would have a lot of room for art all over his walls. And I'm joking in a way, but having whales like that, once they go into the market, don't they just move the market, Scott, altogether? And then to your point about being deflationary, they put them away way, and they're probably not seen for a very long time. That's right. I was actually with a friend last week who was talking about the evolution of art buying, and it's something like you get wealthy from whatever source that is. You start buying planes, and then 10 or 20 years later, you start buying paintings. It is, I think, an evolution that a lot of ultra-wealthy people go through, but it takes time. 
we've spent a little time talking about Web3 and crypto, and there's a lot of these guys and gals who made money probably pretty easily. They've had to take some risk at first here, but they probably figured out the dynamics in the markets. I'm just really intrigued by what they call these OG products like Bored Apes and the Crypto Punks. How do you guys think about those? You used the term cultural significance before about some of these masterworks and some of these more recent artists that have really created community in and around their work in a way. And I buy into the OG ones, but I see no end in sight of just copycat things coming to market. So to me, I think they lack scarcity. If it's a one of 10,000, I just don't understand how they're going to be able to maintain those sorts of floor prices. It's a good question. We, I would say very specifically, don't know how to think about NFTs. And what I mean by that is that we like to sort of operate on fundamentals. So when we think about the NFT market, is there a reliable index that we can understand how NFTs are appreciating through. And what we found is there really isn't. We build indexes for the art market. We follow a methodology that's very similar for case chiller for home price indices. We use that to understand how the market overall is performing, how different segments are performing. And there's different indexes within the NFT space, but none of which we believe accurately represent all of these NFTs, many of which never even sell, by the way. So there's not a good way today to really understand how the market overall is performing. We're attempting to build out an NFT index now within our research team. So I may have more answers to that in the coming months. But right now, we think it's super interesting. We think in aggregate, it could be appreciating. We think it could be a component of an art portfolio or an alternative portfolio down the road. I think we haven't necessarily concluded that yet. I'm just curious though, do you have a lot of interest? Like, do people often compare what they do when they buy, let's say, $5,000 or $10,000 into a bank? See, it's not that different in many ways of buying into some digital art. And so I'm just curious, do you have any data on what the overlap is between the interest in your customers in NFTs and then also fractionalized art? Yeah, we've done some of this research with people in the art market. Are people in the art market who historically buy traditional paintings now buying NFTs? I would say that overlap is very small, but I would say the overlap is very high from self-directed investors who are interested in exploring alternative asset classes generally. How do they think about art versus NFTs? And today they're probably, frankly, conflating it. We have thousands of calls every week with investors I would say at least on a third of those calls, the topic of NFTs comes up. There's clearly huge interest on behalf of the, the retail community. I guess I'm curious, does retail see this as almost like a VC sort of investment as they broaden out into alternatives? Because a lot of alternative investments are not accessible to retail. Like most retail can't invest in a hedge fund. Yeah, you're hitting on something that we think is really interesting and we've never necessarily been able to quantify, but there clearly is a lot of complexity in most types of investments. For example, if I want to buy shares in Google, I have to understand what is Google's EBITDA, what is their management team, how do I think about earnings? It's complicated, right? Even the most intelligent analysts can't necessarily figure that out. With us, you're really just underwriting a single painting. So you can look at that individual work of art, how other paintings have appreciated historically, other things about that artist market, and very quickly make a very specific decision on one work of art. And I think there's a whole community of investors, particularly investors that are, that are not traditional investors per se, that think that what we're doing, it's just an easier way to invest. It's an easier way to look at individual investments in these paintings and decide which ones to invest in versus public companies or other things that are more complicated to understand. And you guys are creating index. You have a lot of data and it's accessible to your customers. Also, do you see on average your customers, do they buy one? Do they buy two? What's the frequency over the course of a year? Do they think about it as creating a portfolio? Yeah, definitely. I mean, most people are starting out by investing in two or three paintings. We tell people to think of, I think our latest recommendation is eight paintings to have sufficient diversification. It's a long-term approach and really building a portfolio of paintings or artists that they find interesting. 
So a lot of my friends in crypto, and I have a couple that run digital asset funds, they've been saying for years, and if you listen to this advice, it's actually really good advice. They're not telling you which crypto asset to buy, but they're saying that you should have, let's say, 2 to 5% of your investable capital exposed to crypto. Now, I'm not asking you to opine on that, but is there any thought process that you guys have that you would say, listen, if you want exposure to alternatives, you've been traditionally invested, let's say, in a 60-40 portfolio exposure exposed to traditional markets, is there some sort of percentage that you think based on the data that you have makes sense for a lot of people now that they have the ability to do it, that they should have exposure to this market? Citibank actually did this asset allocation model first in 2015 on art as an asset class. And when they did it, they looked at all art. So contemporary art historically has performed much better than art overall. But they concluded in 2015 that someone should allocate between 1.4 and 4% of a portfolio to art, depending on their tolerance for illiquidity. Now, what's so amazing about that is from an asset allocation model perspective, they published it, and then I think they probably quickly realized that nobody had a way in 2015 to allocate to the asset class. So they stopped doing the research after that. We work with their research team, actually, and help power some of the research they do today on the art market. But I think that's a very simple indication on how people can think about allocating to art overall obviously, depending on risk tolerance, depending on other factors. But I think that's a good range. I don't know a whole heck of a lot about it, but it seems like a really large market. There was a stat in doing the research for this conversation. It was from Art Basel and UBS that in 2021, there was an estimated $65 billion in art sold last year. That's up nearly 30% from 2020. Can you put some context around that? Because for the most part, the bulk of that are large buyers, but you guys are sizing up. You talk about single digit million paintings, but you guys have your eyes on some bigger works. Today, we're buying paintings between $1 and $20 million per painting. Almost at any point in time, you'll see two or three paintings on the platform that are $10 million plus paintings. These are by artists that are household names, right? Artists like Picasso, Basquiat, Kusama, Herring. Part of the growth, by the way, and that $65 billion number is just that in 2020 with COVID, we weren't seeing a lot of in-person auctions happening. So volume was lower that year, but prices have continued to go up. It was pretty amazing throughout COVID. We've always pitched this asset class and all of our research has indicated that it lacks correlation and that it doesn't behave the same way as public equity. So when COVID happened, we were thinking slash hoping that our research was right and that we wouldn't see our prices collapse similar to public equities. And sure enough, many artists continue to set record prices. And a lot of that is just correlated to growth in the top 1% on a global basis. The wealthier that top 1% gets, for better or for worse, did happen over COVID. More art prices go up. Just explain for a second for listeners who've not been exposed to your product before about the process. When you go into the market, whether it be at auction or a private sale and you buy a painting, you register. So you have this fully compliant registered product with the SEC and you sell shares in it the way that a traditional, let's say, security would be sold. And after your point, I want to get to a very fascinating Twitter thread from a former SEC regulator thinking about Web3. And I want to get your take on some of that, too. Yeah, so our process is pretty straightforward. We buy a painting, we put it into an investment vehicle, in this case, a Delaware LLC. We file that LLC as a public offering with the SEC. So if you go to sec.gov and search for Masterworks, you'll see hundreds of our investment vehicles, which look and feel like S1s of companies going public, but they're individual works of art that you can invest in. We've talked about fine art. We've talked about NFTs. We've talked about real estate. Will you guys broaden out into other collectibles and other things of great value, or are you just going to stick to fine art? Is there a bit of a roadmap that leads you to some different paths? I don't think so. We get asked this question all the time. And at the end of the day, my background really is in the art market. I've been collecting art for 20 years while starting technology companies. And it's an asset class that we really know. And, And our belief is that All of these platforms ultimately have to be asset managers. You have to bring good investments to people that make them money over time. And if you don't, or if your investors lose money, they'll ultimately abandon the platform. And we're very different from that perspective than almost every other investing platform out there. Like most of these companies, if you sit down with the CEO and really ask them, are you a platform or are you an asset manager? They would say, we 100% are a platform. 
And we just don't believe that that's really a choice. We think investors hold quote unquote platforms accountable for bad performing investments at the end of the day. So you're more or less an asset manager, whether you want to be one or not. I've been in the stock market for 25 years and retail interest has only gone bottom left, upper right. Now there have definitely been some troughs there and they had to do with the post.com era, the post-financial crisis, but man, oh man, early last year in 2021, it was the stock market and meme stocks, all the stuff that was going on with GameStop and crypto was going crazy, just the digital tokens. But then the Beeple thing happened. And when the Beeple thing happened, you could have still minted Board apes for what thousands of dollars in gas fees or something like that and now the floor price is i think a hundred thousand dollars and some are trading for millions and so it was just an all-out retail frenzy at the time now things have cooled out and i'm just curious i have to assume that the gamification of traditional financial markets it ebbs and flows. But ultimately, and you said the advent of the internet, and I think that's a really good point, real investors who are in it for the long haul only get more sophisticated. They only get more data. They only get more access to different markets. And so I'm just curious, as we've seen the bottom fall out over the last year on the most speculative sort of stuff, are you guys seeing an increased interest? When the market, the stock market in January and February was just going down, it seemed like almost every day, and at the lows, the S&P 500 was down 15%. Do you see see investors coming to your platform. And I guess maybe I can answer the question because since we last talked, it looks like you guys have grown your customer base by 15 or 20 percent or something like that. Are you seeing increased interest when you see greater volatility in the broad market? Definitely. But I think it's coming from a different source than what a lot of other people think it's coming from. So clearly, if you go back to 2020, COVID is where a lot of this dynamic happened and investors were at home. I think increased volatility in public equities made people more concerned about their public portfolios. I think today, you mentioned it earlier, a lot of people are concerned about inflation. But I think when we think about inflation, we sort of think of it as this red herring that people are latched onto now. But I think the bigger risk to most people's portfolios over the next decade, 15 years, are just frankly the returns that public equities will deliver. If you look at every major private bank and what they're forecasting for public equities over the next decade, it's somewhere between three and seven or eight percent per year. And I think if you talk to most retail investors, which again, we have thousands of these phone calls every week, most retail investors think that their public portfolios will return. 15% a year for the next decade. So from a planning perspective and an expectation perspective, I think retail is just in for a real shock. What does that likely mean? It probably means a lot of investors are not going to be comfortable with their 6% public equity portfolio, their 3% fixed income portfolio, and they'll be looking for other ways or other places to place money. Right now, as you and I are talking, the S&P is down 4%. The NASDAQ's down about 7%. And to your point, we might have pulled forward a lot of performance. The year of the pandemic in 2020, we had stocks that went ballistic because they initially got killed and they closed much higher because of all that stimulus. Last year, the S&P was up 26%. Are you expecting record high valuations in the art market and seeing it expand in 2022 relative to, let's say, more traditional markets? I'm not sure exactly how to think about that. Again, if you look at just contemporary art over the past 25 years, it's appreciated at roughly 14% a year, but it is non-correlated. So for example, we saw art prices slightly decline in 2016, likely due to Brexit or capital controls in China, while public equities outperform. So I think when you're investing in art, you're somewhat making this non-correlation bet that you're going to allocate money into an asset class that behaves differently than your public equity portfolio and maybe other investments you have. We tend to believe that art prices go up the more wealth that's created on that top 1% of people living around the globe. And art really is this currency neutral asset class. I can buy a painting in New York for $10 million, put it on a plane, fly to Hong Kong and sell it. So it is this global currency that ultra wealthy people trade around the world, we tend to think that that population is getting wealthier for better or for worse. So therefore, we tend to believe that our prices continue to go up. Do you see some potential fire sales coming that might prove to be very opportunistic for Masterworks? And I mean this sincerely, when you think about Russian oligarchs and some of the sanctions, the individual sanctions, I know that they've probably, to your point, been buying a lot of fine art for a very long time. Might you see either a lot of art be locked up for a while, or might you see really good opportunities and some big, big works that have just basically been locked up for a long time? 
It's a super fascinating question, and we've been thinking a lot about this with the Russian crisis because today Russia is an insignificant part of the art market, maybe 1% or 2%, but if you went back 10 or 15 years, Russia was maybe 20% at the peak. There was a point in time where oligarchs were buying up a lot of art. So if what was happening today would have happened back then, that would have been a material hit to the art market. As of yet, we haven't seen anyone really selling paintings that would be subject to these sanctions. My guess is many of those oligarchs that own art, this is now off their balance sheet and they creatively don't own it, but we haven't seen it yet. All right, Scott. So to close it out, when you and I first met, it was mid-2021. And at the time, I had just seen you on Jim Cramer's Mad Money show on CNBC. And it was pretty interesting because Jim spends most of his time talking about public equities and talking with the CEOs of public companies. And what he's really trying to do is demystify some of these businesses, break down the stories, and let his audience make their own decisions about how they want to invest in individual names. And when you were on with Jim, he seemed uniquely interested in what you were doing and probably had to do with the whole notion of democratizing a risk asset that most investors generally don't have either access to, or maybe they don't have a lot of great information on. And then it got me thinking in a way, as you and I got to know each other, we started talking offline about some of the NFT stuff in a way. I was like, you know, the ethos of Web3, I think probably really helps your business in a way because you have investors who are looking to put money to work and they're interested in culture. They're interested in community. They think that this is culturally significant in some of the stuff that they're doing online with NFTs. So I'm just curious, in a way, is that part of where you guys are thinking about it, whether it be buying a Banksy fractionalized or thinking about maybe some of the next really cool NFT projects that are out there? You've hit on an interesting point, which is we've really built a framework around this asset class for anyone to ramp up on it and become knowledgeable about it. I talk to people in the art market about this all the time. In any given month, we have more people invest in Andy Warhol by a magnitude of probably 10 than the art market conducts in actual transactions of Andy Warhol paintings, right? So we're ramping up far more people in the art market than the art market ever has It's really fascinating when we look at demand for certain artists, for example, Cause is a great one. I think we have 10 times, 100 times more demand for Cause's work than the art market does, meaning the art market may only be able to place, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 million dollar paintings of his to collectors in any given year. But I think we can raise 100 million dollars for his work. That's really interesting that we're showing that there's more demand for some of these artists through securitized products than there are for their paintings being sold to collectors. But we want to build out a framework and a model for all types of investors to learn about the art market, gain exposure to it, and invest in it. And to your last point, whether that's whole art or whether that's NFTs, I think we're somewhat ambivalent as long as we feel like the investment characteristics are good regardless. Scott, thank you for joining us on OK Computer. Thank you for Masterworks' support of OK Computer. We hope you'll come back. I love learning about the different works that you guys are buying and the interest in them. I think this last Banksy, what did it sell out? And it's just something that most individuals just wouldn't have access to. So I think it's a really interesting market. I can't wait to see what you guys buy next and offer to your clients. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, Dan. Thanks, Scott. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Current, and our supporters, Masterworks and Taboola, for bringing you this episode of OK Computer. If you like what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show. And we want to hear from you. Email us at contact at riskreversal.com. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at OK Computer Pod. We'll see you next time.